Hello, everyone, and welcome back quite expeditiously to the Rebuttal Podcast, where we break down cases, calamity, and chaos. In the legal field, I am once again your host, Reb Maisel. This episode is coming right at you, right after our burglary episode, where I say the word burgle, and all of you chant and cheer. I promised y'all this episode, this sewed, this breakdown, this undertaking. Because as you all know about me, I love to tell you about your rights. I love to tell you about what your rights get you. And I love to tell you about the people who absolutely are trained, told, and advised to do everything in their power to violate those rights, but skirt the line, toe the line between those rights being something that will get you out of prison or those rights simply being a hiccup in the process, but really having no difference or change in the ultimate conclusion. And those people are not every time, but more often than not, law enforcement, prosecutors, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm not saying this because I am trying to sway y'all one way or another on your thoughts on policing, abolition of the prison system, or anything in between. What I am about to tell you today is simply fact. It is not swayed. It is not skewed. It is not theory. It is not opinion. It is fact. Please do not get this twisted. I know I'm opinionated. I know that it can get a little jambalaya. But what isn't jumbled or ambiguous or unclear is that when I am citing case law and I am quoting rule statements from law, from statute, from policy, that's not because I want all of you to somehow adopt this big, large picture conspiracy about how much you hate the police. If you draw those conclusions on your own, do with that what you will. But I also want to emphasize that the policing issue in this country is not solely a product of the police themselves, the prosecutors themselves. The courts and the court system have an extremely high tolerance for police conduct, police deception, and trickery, which is going to be the topic of this episode, than you would ever imagine. And the only reason why uh, the general public doesn't know enough or isn't as informed about the extremely high, high tolerance that our society, the one that we live in, has for conduct and misconduct that many, many people in the legal field are advocating for, for change and reform for. Uh, the reason why is because it's not taught. It is not taught. It's not news. This isn't breaking. This isn't absolutely TMZ worthy, buzz worthy stuff. Okay. This is not clickbait even, even though it should be. I, as I've said before in episodes, as I will always keep repeating, bear with me. I am a firm and staunch and hard advocate and believer for having a required K through 12 course in all American public school systems that advise our children, our society, our new generation, our next generation, our generations after that, of their rights. It is my staunch and firm belief that a society that stands on the principle that they grant their citizens rights, but then turn around and refuse or fail to educate that citizenry on those rights is a society that in fact hasn't granted its citizens rights at all. The only citizens it has granted those rights to 
are the ones who are rich enough or educated enough or lucky enough to be a form of those rights, to have gone out of their way or by their own life experience picked up this knowledge along the way. You cannot say that you grant your American citizenry any sort of liberty or rights in the criminal system, absolutely for sure, our justice system, quote unquote, without teaching them how to exercise those rights. You can give a three-year-old a fucking bike to ride, but unless they are taught how to hop on it, right? How can they really ever do anything for themselves when someone shoves a goddamn two-wheeler in their direction, okay? I think that the bare minimum that we can do for our society, for our citizenry, for our country is a class, a requirement. We all took government, US government. We all took math. We took English. We took social studies. How this isn't a required course. I could teach this course. And I'm not saying it's because I'm brilliant. I'm saying I could teach this course because this shit is not complicated. It doesn't, ma- it doesn't have to be the smart kids. Okay. I don't want it to be some gifted student type shit. All right. It, any student, any student can be taught these basic things. And the problem with it isn't so much that I'm worried about kids because of course I'm worried about kids regardless, right? Juveniles being taken advantage of and not understanding their rights and being thrown into the system very young, especially those that are minority, that are in poverty, that are in high-risk communities. That's, that's a given, okay? That happens all the time in this country. The issue with not teaching our citizenry the rights that they have and should be able to exercise is, is idiots. Idiots are the product of this. And adult idiots are the product of this. It's never the children. It's always the adult ass idiots. Look at any of my comment sections. Anytime I am speaking on even something mildly legal related and it's full of buffoons, loony tunery. And it's not because these people are morons by intention. Often they're on my side. Often, right? And I don't mean that everyone on my side is correct. I'm just saying that often whatever legal concept I'm talking about, they're like, oh yeah, word. And like, that's your fifth amendment, right? Against self-incrimination. And I'll comment and be like, hey, love you so much. No, no, that's not, that's not applicable here. Or, or, you know, the, a very common one is, oh, well, if they don't read me their, uh, my romant- Miranda rights, then I can just get that shit dismissed. Like, it, 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 no, the answer is no. The answer is absolutely not. I'm actually going to get into that in this episode. There is literally a laundry list, okay, a mile and a half fucking long as if I'm Santa and I'm counting the goddamn naughty list. And all I want y'all is to get some gifts rather than some coal because holy shit, okay? The result of our country not taking the initiative to teach its citizens basic fucking rights. I I I want to say is is a mistake, is a is just some dumb oversight, but with the state of the justice system, the prison system, the way the state of plea of guilty pleas of plea bargaining, which I'm going to get into, the state of all of that makes it feel so intentional and makes it feel so very malicious and diabolical. But that's neither here nor there. Actually, it is here and there, and that's where we are today. So let's get into it. I'm going to start off. I'm going to get into it. This is an episode all about how law enforcement can use and utilize deception, trickery, false promises, and everything in between legally to do whatever they want with you, about you, for you, against you, et cetera, et cetera. That is not an opinion. This is a fact. If you have turned off this episode already because you think, oh my God, she's the blue haired bitch. First of all, I'm on YouTube. My hair is in a bunny bun. It's looking very brunette today. Back the fuck up. And second of all, I would serve with a blue hair get up. And third of all, this is the title of a section in a law school textbook. This is not, these are legal terms. The word deception is a legally defined term. The Supreme Court has literally defined it, said that the police can use it and applied it to a case. Like, please, okay? False promises, legally defined term. 
trick trickery, the term trickery, legally special term. Okay. Thank you. I'm angry today in a good way. I look like shambly shit. I threw my hair up in a bun. I pound some makeup on my face. I've had a shit Monday, but I want to do this episode and I had the stuff prepared for it. And now I'm here. So bear with me. If you feel like you're being nagged and yelled at, I am so sorry. Maybe I'll tone it down a bit. Maybe I'll make it more like this, right? You guys seem to like when I do that. Whatever gets you to pass this along to your friends, to pass this along to your children, to pass this along to your neighbors, to pass this along to your worst enemies, I don't care. Even if you say, that bitch is so annoying, fantastic. I've done my job because at least you're talking about it. Thanks. On June 20th, 1991, two police officers brought a black man named Anthony Gray into custody for questioning related to the unsolved rape and murder of a woman in Calvert County, Maryland. During the interrogation, the detectives lied to Mr. Gray about the evidence that police had against him. They told him that two other men had confessed to involvement in the crime and had named Mr. Gray as the killer. They told him that he had failed two hour-long polygraph tests. And they told him that they, quote, knew he had committed the crime. In reality, no one had confessed to the crime or identified Anthony Gray as the perpetrator. Mr. Gray did not fail the polygraph tests. He passed with flying colors. Instead, the police had gathered, quote, a substantial amount of exculpating evidence during the period of time when Mr. Gray was being interrogated. Exculpating evidence means evidence that proves you are innocent. Exculpating evidence included that witnesses reported having seen a lone white man driving from the scene in the victim's car, and the hair evidence that police recovered could have only come from a Caucasian man. But after a series of interrogations in which Mr. Gray was repeatedly confronted with the fabricated evidence against him, Mr. Gray pled guilty. The court imposed two concurrent life sentences. Anthony Gray spent more than seven years behind bars before he was exonerated on the basis of DNA evidence. With the benefit of hindsight, Anthony Gray's ordeal appears to be an unambiguous miscarriage of justice. On the contrary, this type of deception and trickery and the police practice of confronting suspects with false evidence and lies is not only common, in our quote unquote justice system, it is accepted, upheld, and enabled by the US court system, including our very Supreme Court. In another case in 1973, a Connecticut police sergeant accused 18 year old Peter Riley of killing his mother. No witnesses or physical evidence implicated Riley, who had no history of violence. Yet after hours of interrogation and denials, the sergeant told Riley, that he failed a polygraph exam. Eventually, this disorienting result led Riley to question his own innocence. Quote, this test is giving me doubts right now, he conceded. Led to believe that he blocked the event from consciousness, Riley later said, well, it really looks like I did it. Later still, he confessed to slashing his mother's throat with a razor. After Riley was convicted and spent time in prison, the prosecutor discovered exculpatory evidence in his case file and all charges were dismissed. In a second case, 20 years later, 41-year-old Gary Gauger woke up on the family farm in Illinois and found his parents stabbed to death. Detectives said they found blood-soaked clothes in his bedroom and a bloody knife in his pocket, both lies. They also falsely claimed that he failed a polygraph. Gauger broke down and concluded that he must have killed his parents during an alcohol-induced blackout. After five years in prison, including time spent on death row, he was released. Two motorcycle gang members were later convicted of the murders. This type of deception continues unabated to this day. In 2014, 22-year-old Malthy Thompson, born in Denmark, traveled to New York City for a teaching internship at a preschool. Based on an allegation from an unreliable source, a sex crimes detective interrogated him for hours and told him that surveillance videos showed him touching children in sexual ways. No such footage existed. 
a confused Thompson signed a confession and then went on camera, quote, this morning, he said, I had a rude awakening. Thompson was arrested, charged, vilified in local newspapers and sent to Rikers Island before prosecutors dismissed all charges. Five years later, Thompson died of a blood clot in his heart. Just like the Time magazine article I am quoting from, I could spend hours dressing down, unraveling, listing every single case that sounds a lot like this. I would run myself mad going in circles, trying to find the most damning, the most interesting, the most bloody, the most gory, the best one to really get you guys hooked and drawn in and spend an hour unpacking one single case. But it's never one single case. It's not even 10. It's not even 15. It's not even 100. It is thousands of cases. I am not kidding. Thousands of cases that we know about where someone confesses based on intentional and allowed and enabled police deception and trickery or another unmentionable, unquantifiable number of guilty pleas that are entered by innocent people simply because the police do not have to tell them anything about the extent of their deception or lies or the evidence, quote unquote, that they claim to have against them that convinces them ultimately to just bite the bullet and take the guilty plea because really in this country, why take the odds of winning at trial when the loss would impact your life so much more? When the sentence that you are offered in exchange for a guilty plea even though you are innocent, is something that you can live with, but you cannot live with going to trial and losing based on all of this bullshit evidence that you don't know is bullshit yet because they don't have to tell you is bullshit yet before you make your guilty plea, okay? Um, And going away for years and years as opposed to maybe just probation, literally. Sometimes that's the line drawn in the sand. Having a voluntary confession. Making a voluntary guilty plea is the standard, right? Is the only way that due process can really happen in this country is if you meaningfully enter that guilty plea knowing what comes from it, knowing the consequences of it. But the idea and the concept and principle of informed consent is not, not the same in the legal system as it would be in the medical field, for example. You know what informed consent is, right? How can you really consent to a medical procedure even if they tell you the risks, right? The consequences of it, okay? When you don't even know how great your odds are of living. Truly, they don't tell you. They intentionally don't tell you. In fact, they lie to you about it. In fact, they make shit up. (laughs) They make shit up. And you sign the page, you sign the paper. If that would happen, doctors would be would be in jail in prison. It would be malpractice out the who hang. Right? When it comes to your life, okay, the reason for informed consent, of course. Um, super important because it's your body, your life, your decision. And um, even if it could potentially save your life. We want to make sure that people who are making absolutely life-altering health decisions know exactly what the risks and benefits and consequences could possibly be and what your chances are. Copy and paste that to justice, to the justice system. When you are entering a guilty plea, when you are gambling with your life, when you are making a decision that will alter the course of your life, when you have your life in your own hands, are you legally required to have everything you could possibly have to make that decision? Okay, fine. That's too much. That's too much, Reb. Totally get it. Okay. Are you required to have all of the material information 
that you could have about about the police's case against you, the facts, the evidence, what they have, what they don't have, just the important shit, just the most important stuff. You don't have to tell me everything, okay? You don't have to tell me everything. I'd love to know everything, but just just the important shit. No, the answer is no. The answer is a hard no. Okay, 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 fine. Fine, Reb, fine, Reb. Okay, even if we don't have to tell you them everything or even the important shit. How about just tell us, okay, be able to tell you, the criminal defendant, the accused, whether or not the cops um, lied to you. How about we just have the right to know before we enter a guilty plea if the cops are using some deception, some trickery. If the cops lied to me during this process before I enter my guilty plea about evidence that they have and they actually don't have. Because then maybe I can make a better, a better fucking decision on whether or not I actually will chance it and go to trial and plead not guilty because I actually didn't do it. They said that they had someone pick me out of a fucking lineup. What am I supposed to do about that? I wasn't even there. But I don't have an alibi. I can't prove it. I was asleep on my bed. I don't want to chance it. I just want to take probation. But if they don't have any of that fucking evidence that they say that they have, then maybe I'll chance it. How about that, Reb? Can we at least know that? The answer is no. The answer is no, you can't. And the answer is that the court system has repeatedly held that you can't. That You have no right to that. You have no right to know how good the case is against you before you enter a guilty plea. You have no right to know how bad the case is against you until you enter a guilty plea. The cops can tell you complete lies about all the evidence they have stacked against you, and they have no affirmative duty or right to disclose the nature, the true nature of the evidence they have against you or the evidence that they have collected instead of that lying ass, fake ass evidence that actually proves that you're innocent. Do you want to know why? I'll tell you why. Because you are only entitled to receive exculpatory evidence, okay? Evidence that tends to prove, your, prove that you are innocent from the police that they have gathered, that they've collected, that they know of, if you plead not guilty and you go to trial. That's when you can have that. That's when you can start realizing, oh, the police were lying about all that shit. Oh, shit, they actually don't have that fucking polygraph test that they said I failed. I actually passed it with flying colors. Oh, they said that I had my fingers prints out the seam. No, they fucking didn't. They smudged a, their own finger on a piece of glass and brought it into the interrogation room just to freak me out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you enter a guilty plea, you have no right to any of that. You, don't, you have no right to even know whether anything is true or false. All you know is the indictment against you and what your public defender tells you. And the public defender doesn't know that shit. Not yet. So, uh, yeah. If you guys were wondering why I have a bit of a strong, I wouldn't say opinion, I would say um, a strong knowledge of fact. It's because I don't mess around. I don't play. I don't fuck around when it comes to law enforcement activity and the ways in which our rights, our, our rights are not protected in ways that are meaningful in ways that have an impact throughout the country in policy changing type ways. You can, you can talk your throat sore and police have tried to about every single singular one person, two person, three person, right? Like case this, oh, this case and that case and this case and that case and this case and that case, that didn't happen. And in this case, that didn't happen. And in this case, that didn't happen. Amazing. I don't give a shit. The policy in this country does not protect the ones who are the most vulnerable. The ones who are the most vulnerable are me and you. Okay, 
just because we have hero stories, quote unquote, of police officers doing the right thing and not charging the person that they thought it was because they didn't have enough evidence and they actually didn't convince them to take a guilty plea. But da 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 da. I'm okay. I don't give a fuck. It's giving. I should feel bad for the 1%. I don't. I look at the 99 because the 99 are me and you. And when I say me and you in a very real way, just because I'm an attorney doesn't mean that any any day, any day of the week, any day of the month, um, I could be, right? Any, any of us, any of us could be accused of a crime they literally didn't commit, they weren't physically present for, uh, and told a whole bunch of bullshit. And simply because I have a lot more knowledge in the system, I probably have an upper hand against a lot of people simply because I have knowledge of what goes on. But uh, why... Why doesn't anyone else? Why doesn't anyone know any of that shit? Why doesn't anyone know that half the shit that police tell you is 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 a legal lie? It's a legally permissible lie. They they employ deception, trickery, trickery, and lies not because they are gaming the system. They're using the system that is given to them. They're not using a cheat code. They're playing campaign. Okay. The Supreme Court has routinely and consistently upheld the use of deceptive police practices in the investigation of criminal suspects. It is absolutely clear that law enforcement personnel may engage in fraud and even lie in the pursuit of legitimate enforcement objectives. The law is severely lacking in safeguards to prevent suspects from making plea decisions based on inaccurate information about their likelihood of conviction at trial. To date, legal scholarship addressing this type of police trickery has focused on its risk of producing false confessions, and with good reason. More than 10% of the nearly 2,000 American exonerees falsely confessed to the crime for which they were wrongfully convicted. But these statistics fail to capture the bigger picture. Approximately 94% of state convictions and 97% of federal convictions result from guilty pleas. Indeed, a guilty plea as opposed to a confession constitutes a larger victory for law enforcement officers who believe, rightly or wrongly, that a suspect committed a crime. After a guilty plea is entered, there will be no trial and barriers to appeal are nearly insurmountable. Reversals of convictions resulting from guilty pleas are extremely rare. Because of that, there is a devastatingly small number of false guilty plea exonerations and associated case law to fuel wrongful convictions literature, particularly on the topic of police using the false evidence ploy. In a country where more than 2 million people are incarcerated, even a marginally heightened risk of false guilty pleas translates into a number of unwarranted years that people spend behind bars that is difficult to contemplate and impossible to justify. Courts apply the legal standard articulated in Frazier versus Cup for whether or not the police have violated your Fifth Amendment rights okay, in deception and trickery, etc. Only when suspects do not plead guilty and instead exercise their right to a trial. The criminal justice system provides a few, if any, tools to limit the coercive effects of the false evidence ploy during the plea bargaining process. Because like I said, the police have no duty to tell you how good their case is truthfully against you or to admit when, at what time, and about what they employed lies, deception, trickery, etc. When you are considering whether to roll the dice on a trial and plead not guilty or to take the guilty plea because it results in a lesser sentence, lesser charge, okay, and I know all of you are always thinking like, oh, murder, 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 like the worst thing you can think of. This is like, like imagine pleading down for like a larceny charge, right? Like uh, if I if I get off, amazing, I get off, but I don't get off uh, two to five years in prison or if I just plead guilty, it's probation. Like you guys, like the, that that's the type of shit that we're dealing with here. That's the type of shit that we're dealing with. It's so fucking reasonable for people to plead guilty when they're weighing the fucking benefits and risks, even if they had nothing to do with it, okay? 
when the police are lying their fucking tails off, especially when they're lying their fucking tails off, all right? They're not paid to prove you innocent. They're not paid to prove you innocent. We are. The lawyers are. Public defenders are. Thank you. The Reed technique is the most influential and widely used interrogation protocol in the United States. An organization called John E. Reed and Associates developed the method in the mid 20th century and has since trained more interrogators than any other organization in the world. The Reed technique is codified in Criminal Interrogation and Confessions, otherwise known as the Reed Manual, a handbook that is frequently termed the quote, Bible of Modern Police Interrogation Training. Over the past several decades, the Reed Manual's approach to interrogation has shaped, quote, nearly every aspect of modern police interrogations from the setup of the interview room to the behavior of detectives. Detectives' use of fabricated evidence is no exception. The Reed Manual teaches law enforcement to carry out the false evidence ploy because it is clearly the most persuasive interrogation tactic within the area of deception, quote unquote, within the area of deception that we're already employing for sure. It instructs detectives to, for example, bring visual props into the interview room, including a DVD disc, CD-ROM, audio tape, a fingerprint card, an evidence bag containing hair or other fibers, spent shell casings, and vials of colored liquid. It also announces a clear position that, quote, merely introducing fictitious evidence during an interrogation cannot lead to false admissions of guilt. That's a bit of a reach, babes. I don't know. I don't touch fucking grass. Find out. Contradicting decades of social science evidence and scores of DNA exonerations, the Reed Manual states that, quote, it is absurd to believe that a suspect who knows he did not commit a crime would place greater weight and credibility on alleged evidence than his own knowledge of innocence, end quote. Do you know how fucking out of pocket, insane, batshit, crazy, head up your own ass you have to be? to believe that statement. Like, I want to be that delusional in my everyday life, that deluge, right? Delulu. But unfortunately for you, me, and the pine fucking trees, the read manual teaches law enforcement how to interrogate. The read manual literally tells them, it's all good, homie. They're definitely guilty if you do all of this and they still fucking get that guilty plea, right? They pled guilty, bitch. They're trying to fucking wait. They're trying to cut their fucking losses here. The Reed Manual also defends the use of, quote, outright lies concerning the existence of evidence by assuring law enforcement that the practice is legal and routinely upheld under the Supreme Court's totality of the circumstances standard. It cites the foundational case addressing the permissibility of the false evidence ploy, Frazier v. Cup, from 1966, in which the defendant brought a habeas corpus action to challenge his murder conviction in Oregon. Frazier's attorneys made a variety of arguments, including the claim that Frazier's confession was involuntary because the police falsely told him that they had secured a confession from his companion. The court devoted little space to this claim in its opinion, merely noting that, quote, the fact that the police misrepresented the statements that Frazier's companion had made is, while relevant, insufficient in our view to make this otherwise voluntary confession inadmissible. These cases must be decided by viewing the totality of the circumstances, which is what we use today and what fucks us up every which way. Mm -hmm. In the decades since Frazier was published, lower courts have consistently deployed the opinion as legal cover for far more coercive uses of the false evidence ploy than just the fabricated co-defendant confession at play in Frazier itself, for example. The North Carolina Supreme Court cited Frazier in support of its decision to uphold a confession generated after police presented the suspect with a bloody knife and falsely asserted that it was found at the scene of the crime with the suspect's fingerprints on it. Lower courts also have cited Frazier in support of decisions to admit confessions obtained after police falsely told a suspect that his fingerprints had been found at the scene of the crime or on the murder weapon, that they possessed DNA evidence proving his guilt, that his hair or shoe prints were found at the location of the crime, that his semen was recovered from the crime scene, that he failed a polygraph test or gunshot residue test, 
and that eyewitnesses identified him as the perpetrator. Further examples abound. They are countless. Those are just a few. Every single one that I just listed has a different fucking millions of cases that go to it. Okay. That say, yeah, that, that, that should happen. Right. The courts tend to only apply the Frazier standard, totality of the circumstances standard, to instances where the suspect exposed to the false evidence ploy confesses, does not plead guilty, and then argues that the confession should not be used as evidence against them. But this mode of police deception is not designed to induce only confessions. Rather, the false evidence ploy may motivate a suspect to incriminate herself by one, confessing, two, pleading guilty, or three, both. Only the first category of cases is likely to ever make it to a court's review. But existing social science evidence can be read to suggest that innocent suspects are more likely to fall into the latter two categories, aka the ones who plead guilty and never have their day in court, never see a trial, never are able to get it in front of a judge because they don't even find out that the evidence allegedly that the cops claim that they had against them that they used in determining whether or not they should they should definitely fight this and plead not guilty or just plead guilty and take the plea okay whether using it to make that decision oh uh, yeah they never find out they never find out the police case is bullshit because the police never have to show them shit suspects may falsely confess as an act of compliance when they perceive that there is strong evidence against them of course second innocent suspects confronted with evidence that law enforcement claims to prove their guilt as an incontrovertible incontro fact may falsely confess because they have come to internalize the belief that they committed the crime without awareness the key factor underlying each of these psychological processes is that the defendant's perception that his or her likelihood of conviction at trial is high a perception that has been found to be particularly important in plea decision making. What a shock. The sky is blue. The ground is green. My face is white. This world is fucked. Although deception or misrepresentation by a police officer in an interview may be factors for a court to consider in determining whether a confession is voluntary, the improper conduct must be a direct cause of the confession in order for the confession to be overturned. Lying about the state of the evidence is not the sort of, quote, overreaching that implicates a violation of the due process clause, so long as the subterfuge used is not one, quote, likely to produce an untrue statement, unquote. These are quotes pulled from court cases that are applicable, that are drawing rule statements from over 50, 60, 70 years of precedent. This is not news. This is normal. I'm not saying this in an angry tone because I think that every single police deceptive tactic has led to the miscarriage of justice. I have an angry tone about it because the way that police deception and trickery is applied to real life situations fucks people over beyond belief because you being a person okay who broke the law does not mean that you're not entitled to rights you being someone who didn't break the law does not mean that you're not entitled to rights so much fucking police deception and trickery that actually would for sure be thrown the fuck out on a due process analysis is never even found out by the court or by the defendant is never even known to exist by anybody except for the police. You guys, there is no requirement. There's no legal requirement for the police to admit to lying and deception and trickery or to hand over the evidence that they have or don't have against a defendant for a defendant to plead guilty. Like, at trial, Brady violations apply. Brady, as in like, you know, Brady violations, the, the police have to hand over exculpatory evidence, meaning evidence that tends to prove the innocence of the defendant, okay? 
that's a whole nother can of worms that I'll get it. Oh, don't even fucking get me started. It's another episode, okay? What I'm talking about is this is the pre-stage, okay? This is like where a defendant is told by the police all this absolute tomfoolery bullshit, okay? And it doesn't necessarily solicit a confession, all right? But the defendant, you know, gets a lawyer, whatever, whatnot, and, and ultimately pleads guilty before trial ever happens, right? They don't plead the not guilty. They plead guilty because basically they're told, hey, um, so based on what the police have told us, which they can lie about to us right now because they don't have to tell us whether the shit is true or not. Um, if you go to trial and you lose, even though you, you are 100% innocent, even though you know and you believe that you are 100% innocent, if you go to trial, you lose, that's 10, 15 years. If you just plead guilty now, it's like two to five with probation. What would you like to do? And reasonable people, reasonable, rational, innocent people will take the lesser of two evils because they they know how the police system works. They know how the justice system works. They're hedging their fucking bets. Like, sorry. Okay, goodbye. Especially if you are a person of color in this country. Would you want to risk a trial? Well, I'm innocent. Of course I would. You look, listen, look and listen. Okay, look and fucking listen. The police may say almost anything to try to get you to admit to a crime or offer up information that could lead to an arrest, warrant, or incriminating evidence. That means they may say almost anything at any time. All right? Everyone thinks that the police interactions that I'm talking about are where you are in an interrogation room and Detective Stabler has his dumb muscles out with his suit jacket off and his tie undone and he's sitting there with his big arms crossed and his biceps out and you are in a dark shady room in a fucking police station getting questioned bitch no i'm yes talking about that but guess when else i'm talking about it when a police walks up to you on the fucking street when they're asking you about shit that's going down okay any type of interaction any type of one they may say almost anything almost anything to try to get you to admit to a crime or offer up information that could lead to an arrest, uh, whether of you or someone else or to get a warrant or to get incriminating evidence. Okay. At any time they can lie about having your fingerprints at the scene. They can lie about being able to get a warrant to search your property. That's often used. Okay. They'll knock on your fucking door and you'll say, no, I don't consent to a search because you never fucking voluntarily consent to a search. Do not voluntarily consent to a search. Your denial of consent to a search cannot be used against you to form probable cause to arrest you, okay? Because you have the fucking right to refuse, consent to, 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 refuse to consent to a search, okay? As just a regular fucking citizen, okay? Whether it be of your bag, of your car, whatever, always say no, even if you have nothing in your fucking place, even if you have nothing wrong, always just say no. You wanna know why? Because of the shit that I'm gonna tell you right now. Well, if I'm innocent, why wouldn't I just say yes? Because are you fucking out of your mind? They are not, their job is not to make you innocent or to prove you innocent. Their job is to, is to put someone behind bars. Like that's literally the fact of it. That's literally the fucking fact of it. Lo siento, I'm sorry. Even if they wanna phrase it as, our job is to, is to write, get to the bottom of who did it, exactly. Their job isn't to get to the bottom of who didn't do it. Are you fucking out of your minds? Do not consent to a search. If they really have to search your place to get to the bottom of it, then they should be able to get a warrant for it. And then they can do as they please. Okay. They can do, they can do what the warrant says they can do. Right. You got, you got to go get a warrant, bitch. Get a fucking warrant, bitch. Okay. Look, listen, look, and listen. You not consenting to a search is not an obstruction of justice. Believe that. Do not let a cop convince you that it is. They'll try to, but it's not, okay? Cops often, very fucking often, will tell people when they're in their cars, when they're outside of their cars, when they're in their apartment, when they have a backpack on their shoulders, even though they are not under arrest at any point, do not have probable cause to search that bitch, they will tell them, hey, can I search your backpack? Can I search your place? Like, let me search. Can I search? And you'll say, no. And they'll say, well, we, we can get a warrant in two minutes. We're gonna get a warrant anyway. We're going to do it anyway. That is a lie. That's a fucking lie. That's hilarious and a lie. You can't get a warrant in two fucking minutes, bitch. And even if you fucking could, then do it. Do it. That's what you say. Okay, then do it. Slam. Thank you. They can lie about getting you a reduced sentence if you cooperate. I repeat, they can lie about getting you a reduced sentence if you quote unquote cooperate. They can even say that they have an eyewitness who can place you at the scene of the crime. 
These are just some examples. These are literally like the first ones that popped in my fucking head. Like you're kidding, okay? And you're gonna you're gonna see more of them. Once Miranda warnings are given and a person in custody gives a statement to police without invoking his right to remain silent and without requesting an attorney, remember, you have to do both. You have to say, I affirmatively evoke my right to remain silent and I'm exercising it and I want my right to an attorney. I want an attorney right now. You say those two things. You have to say both. Why don't I just stay quiet? Because both of them give you new, give you give you fucking protection. Fuck. Thank you. After you've been given Miranda warnings, okay, you give a statement to police without invoking your right to remain silent and without requesting an attorney, you have in effect waived your rights. You've waived them. And the use of trickery or deceit to obtain a confession does not render it inadmissible so long as the means employed are not calculated to procure to procure an untrue statement, quote unquote. That is quoted from my court case. But the issue with Miranda, okay, that people always have that that y'all need to process and un- understand, okay, real quick right now, is you think that Miranda is this fucking gold standard of safety and just blankets you in a blanket of, of just trust and comfort. And, and before you, right, if you haven't heard those pretty magic words of Miranda, you have the right to remain silent. Everything you can say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney. You know the vibes. Okay, da, 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 da. okay whatever. You, you're thinking, oh, well, until I hear those pretty words, I'm good. I can say what I... Shut your fucking mouth police violate Miranda all the time. They they fail to tell you your Miranda rights all the time or they say them in some weird fucked up way that like barely passes muster, okay? They don't have to say the exact words. They just have to say some reasonable like substantially enough of the Miranda for it to for it to hit, for it to hit different, okay? For it to hit the beat. All right? Yes, the general rule is that Miranda warnings are required prior to any custodial interrogation. What is a custodial interrogation? A custodial interrogation is one that is the equivalent of an arrest, okay? It's like the equivalent of you not being free to fucking leave, okay? What does that mean? It means that all y'all with the chatterboxes, chatter fucking mouths, okay? Y'all mocking J ass bitches will talk your fucking head off to police when you are not under custodial interrogation, you are not under arrest. You could have just said, am I free to leave? And they would have been like, yes, you like you're fucking free. And you just talked because you're trying to convince them not to arrest you. Baby, they're trying to convince themselves how they can potentially possibly arrest you. Shut your fucking mouth. Regardless, it is an absolute black letter rule that you do have to, the police do have to give you Miranda warnings prior to, prior to a custodial interrogation. Okay. After being given these, then you can waive your Miranda warnings without an attorney being present. Meaning that if you sh- that if after they say you have the right to remain silent and you don't exercise that fucking right, basically you have the right but not the ability to shut your mouth. Uh, yeah, that's waiving. You waive, okay? Uh, and then if you you know t- want to talk to them and you don't ask for an attorney, yeah, you're waiving. All right. But the beauty of it, the beauty of it is that you can waive and then re- reinstate. You can waive. And then take it back. Okay. You can go, wait a minute. If you right, all of a sudden this episode pops into your head and you're like, yeah, anyways. And you're in the middle of a sentence and then go, wait a minute. Reb told me to shut. Actually, I'm exercising my right to remain silent and I want an attorney. You can do that at any fucking time. There is no like, oh, sucks too late. Do it. Even if you like, look, no one's going to be mad at you. No one's going to be mad at you. Do it as soon as you possibly can. Do it when you remember. Do it, do it, do it. Okay. Whenever you fucking can. You can flip a U-turn and go back to fucking green. All right? Amazing. But the problem with it is that everyone thinks Miranda warnings are this big safeguard, beautiful thing. And yes, Miranda warnings are required for a reason. Okay, required because our court, okay, our Supreme Court basically held that inherent in the fifth Amendment due process clause, okay, our right to due process of law, the giving of Miranda warnings should be required, okay, should be required. But Miranda warnings themselves are merely a protective device to prevent the violation of Fifth Amendment rights. They offer a warning sign before barbed wire. You can still get stuck. Great. The reason why that is, is because 
Miranda violations, meaning Miranda rights not given when they were supposed to be given or Miranda rights not given at all, have no fruit of the poisonous tree consequences, which is a term we use, okay? Fruit of the poisonous tree. When something is a fruit of the poisonous tree consequence, it means that not only the evidence that you got in violation, okay, like based on that violation is thrown out, but also all evidence that you acquired after that because of the initial evidence that you got in violation, okay? Fourth Amendment violations, search and seizure violations, right? Unreasonable search and seizures do have fruit of the poisonous tree consequences generally, okay? Meaning if someone, if the police barge into your home without a warrant, okay, and no consent, and they find a bunch of shit in here, okay, a bunch of shit in your house, but they obviously barge into your house in violation of your Fourth Amendment right against unreasonable searches and seizures, all of the evidence that they found in this house would be thrown out. In addition to any evidence that they found after this dumb, stupid Fourth Amendment violation search that was basically they would never have found if not for this search. Okay. So basically if they like, right, found um, a, a, a list on your kitchen counter that, that had, you know, a location of like a warehouse or some shit. And then they went to the fucking warehouse on that piece of paper that they found inside your house in violation of your un uh, fourth amendment rights. And they found that new location and found more, more evidence there. Yeah. It, it generally, okay. Would be thrown out. Do you see why fruit of the poisonous tree consequences is like a good thing, right? It's supposed to be a deterrent to police violating people's rights because of course they're going to do it. Like they would, they don't give a fuck. They don't give a fuck. Trust me when I tell you that. They do not give a flying frickaroo. They have to have some incentive to not do it in a way that hurts their job, which like it won't ever hurt their job because like they'll keep their fucking jobs for God, I'm sure. They don't get fired for this shit, by the way, ever, infinity. Oh, no. Um, they will not be able to build a case because the court will say that's fucking hilarious. That shit's out. What do you got? Like it's supposed to be right. Encouraging them to maybe like do their fucking jobs in a way that uh, is, ju is, is just and not like a violation of your rights. Okay. But, but Miranda warning violations. Okay. Miranda violations do not have fruit of the poisonous tree consequences. Meaning, meaning, meaning that if you are being custodially interrogated, okay, that doesn't have to be at a police station. It can be, obviously, but it doesn't have to be. It can be them crowding you in a corner, okay, and not letting you leave, like in a uh, anywhere, in public, anywhere. A custodial interrogation can take place in the back of a police car. It can take place anywhere, okay? You don't have to be in cuffs. You do not have to be in a room at the police station. It's fact sensitive, all right? So anytime, that's why lawyers are like, anytime you're talking to police, like, keep it tight. Keep it cute or keep it mute or do both. Keep it cute and keep it mute. Like slay, but like shut your face. <laughs> so if a police officer, okay, walks up to you on the street and basically tells you you're not free to leave, okay, like there you are under a custodial interrogation, whether they have probable cause or not, okay, that's all determined later. Like who fucking knows, okay? Whatever you say from the time it's a custodial interrogation until the time that you're given Miranda in fucking theory should be excluded. Those statements that you make, okay? Because, right, you weren't given Miranda. So they should be excluded. When you're given Miranda, though, everything after that, yeah, not excluded. And also, the fruit of the poisonous tree consequences do not apply. The statement is excluded, but any evidence within the statement that you say is not excluded. Also, any second statements given after the Miranda rights are given. Does that make sense? If I said the words, I robbed the bank on First Street, the statement that I said that is excluded. If I wasn't given my Miranda rights, but I was under custodial interrogation, okay? But the bank on First Street and them going to investigate and them like finding out that I did rob that bank, all that shit, right? If they had no idea about this bank before, whatever, that evidence within that statement is not excluded. Like 
they can bring that into court at trial and be like first rate, first rate, first rate. Like it, there's no, even though the only reason why they found out about the first rate situation is because they didn't give you Miranda or whatever, right? Does that make sense? That's why. Um, oh yeah. And it doesn't affect like them having probable cause to like arrest you. Like if they have probable cause to arrest you or a arrest warrant or whatever, anything based on anything else other than your like Miranda violation statement, bitch, you're going like, yeah, like nothing's being thrown out. Like y'all think it is. That's why I'm like, this is such an easy class to teach in fucking K through 12. Like it's so fucking easy. Like this, this is not hard. Like, oh my God, I could do a chart. I could do a diagram. I could like do like cute little like fucking pictures. You know what I mean? I could do hypos. Like, God, I wish I could like put me in chart, put me on a zoom, hop on my everyone, everyone who's under the age of 18, hop on a zoom. Anyone who's over the age of 18, hop on a zoom. Like I will get on it right now. Overall, the use of, de of deception or subterfuge does not alone invalidate a confession as a matter of law, but it is a factor to consider in examining the totality of the circumstances. So too is the use of promises by police to induce a confession even false promises, okay? Trickery, all of that. That is not inherently incorrect or wrong or illegal, technically. Police deception alone does not render a confession involuntary as would violate due process. Because of this, police officers are trained on interrogation techniques and may lie about insignificant or important things to try to get a suspect to cooperate or confess. They may create little white lies about themselves and their backgrounds to try to build rapport with a suspect. They may claim that they'll put in a good word with the judge if the suspect confesses. They may say that they have an accomplice in, well, they may say that they have an accomplice in the other room who is spilling his or her guts about the crime. Trickery, quote unquote, involves affirmative acts of fraud or deceit. Police have no duty to disclose to an accused all material facts known to them from other sources prior to interrogation. No duty. They don't have to tell you what they have, what they don't have. They don't have to tell you how good their case is. They don't have to tell you shit that is honest, except for the fucking Miranda rights, which as I told you, could come late in the game regardless. In Miranda versus Arizona, the court required that any statements resulting from custodial interrogation must be preceded by warnings of the suspect's right to remain silent and to have the assistance of counsel during the interrogation and to be occasioned by a waiver of those rights. In coming to that conclusion, the Miranda court reviewed a number of police interrogation tactics that it gleaned from police interrogation manuals, literally pulled out from them many of which are deceptive in nature. No shit. For example, the manuals advised police to display confidence in the suspect's guilt, to downplay the seriousness of the offense under investigation, to use a rigged identification procedure or a reverse lineup in which the suspect is identified as the perpetrator of a fictitious crime in the hopes that he will confess to a real one and to imply and to employ the good cop bad cop routine which relies on one officer offering false sympathy to the subset to the suspect however the court was careful not to declare any of these deceptive tactics off limits to the police post miranda the court has had little occasion to directly address police deception during interrogations however starting with fraser versus cup a handful of cases have generally permitted such deception. In Frazier v. Cup, a case from 1969, the United States Supreme Court decided to allow a confession into evidence even though police falsely told the suspect that his cousin had already confessed and implicated him in the crime. That ruling has since been used throughout the country to sanction police deception in the interrogation room. Here is a small batch of quotes, cites pulled directly from court cases in this country. Psychological tactics such as deception or misrepresentation do not prevent a finding of voluntary confession so long as the confession is a product of the suspect's own balancing of competing considerations. 
officers misstating the strength of the prosecution's case against a defendant interferes little, if at all, with the defendant's free and deliberate choice of whether to confess. A defendant's will is not overborne, such that his confession is rendered involuntary simply because he is led to believe that the government's knowledge of his guilt is greater than it actually is. The police may actively deceive a suspect without destroying the voluntariness of a confession. The use of misstatements or tricks in and of themselves does not render a confession or admission involuntary. You're probably thinking, wow, all of these rule statements, rules, case law analysis, analyses on deception, police deception, trickery, misrepresentations, false statements to a defendant, they all seem to always, always fucking relate to a confession, right? And you're probably thinking, oh, well, I would never confess to a crime, right? No, 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 no. We're, we're all capable and very much have the potential to confess to a crime that we did not commit. But uh, that is not the point of this episode. The point of this episode is to highlight the fact that simply because a defendant a suspect does not confess to a crime does not mean that their lives are not irrevocably altered directly because of police deception and trickery. The false evidence ploy enables interrogators to artificially inflate an innocent suspect's estimated likelihood of conviction and thereby make a plea bargain appear, quote, rational. Innocent suspects who were not at the crime scene may not know whether there were witnesses or physical evidence left behind. They also may be uncertain of whether they committed a crime if, for example, they were intoxicated or are mentally handicapped. Most people, even though there are so many examples of people not being rational and right, good at weighing the odds, making good choices, whatnot, um, most people whether it be the most powerful or people that you may have biased against or or may see as hardened criminals, no. Anyone from your one-time shoplifter at 19 who right got caught on a two HD high def security camera to someone who's burgled the fourth house that week, anyone Anyone, anyone can choose and, ve- and very much does choose to plead guilty to a crime when they do not have all of the information that they could have about the police's case and where the police have basically shoved them into a position where they have no choice but to believe the worst case scenario, which is that all of the evidence that the police have l- potentially lied about and have very well lied about and told them that they have and they really don't is true. And they actually do have all of that, right? Imagine a scenario where you did not, absolutely did not shoplift from a store. You know you didn't shoplift, but they said that they have on security tape that you grabbed things from the shelf. And you say, can I see it? Nope, you'll see it at trial. And all you want to do, right, is just go home, get off, whatever. And, and let's say that the worst case scenario, the worst case scenario Punishment for that is something that just can't, right? What if it were jail time? What if it were? What if they charge you with it? What if they said, hey, if you do not plead guilty, we're going to charge you with larceny. We're going to charge you with felony larceny. You're going to go away for years, potentially. This is, you're going to be a felon. You can never vote. Your whole life is ruined, uh, uh, ruined at 19. That's what they'll tell you, right? Quote unquote. Of course, your whole life isn't ruined if you get charged with a crime or convicted of a crime. Uh, so many people are convicted of crimes in this country that are very much having lovely, enjoyable lives. But uh, yeah, what if you're faced with that at 19? And they say, or you can just plead guilty. You'll get six months probation. We won't charge you felony. We'll charge you with that misdemeanor. We'll throw you a bone. Think about it. And the only reason why I give you these hypos and the only reason why I lean into that is simply because the prejudice and the awful, awful, awful treatment that people who are charged with crimes in this country receive is is astounding, especially because you cannot be critical of the policing system in a way that's meaningful and still genuinely believe and think that everyone who's charged or convicted or pleads guilty to a crime is really the heathen that 
they're made out to be. They are products and victims and results of the system, and they feel the effects of it more than you do. So enough. In light of research indicating that innocent defendants are on average more risk averse than guilty ones, it is not difficult to recognize the possibility that an innocent defendant would accept a relatively small punishment by pleading guilty in order to avoid risking a greater one after trial. Further pressures to plead guilty when facing a substantial probability of conviction exacerbate this effect. These include the financial cost of a trial, the stress of waiting for a court date and preparing for an uncertain result, and for defendants whose plea offers do not involve incarceration, the ability to return home. Even though the number of innocents who have pleaded guilty is, quote, un- inherently unknowable, the literature makes clear that plea bargaining has an innocence problem. The plea bargaining process also enables the state to circumvent many of the barriers to wrongful conviction that trials provide. Perhaps most important, the plea bargaining process strips suspects of their opportunity to learn whether they was they were subjected to the false evidence ploy in the first place. While the federal rules of criminal procedure require judges to ensure that guilty pleas are, quote, voluntary, the legal standard of voluntariness in the plea context does not entitle defendants to information about the strength of the state's evidence against them, including whether or not false evidence was presented in the interrogation. There is reason to believe that this lack of obligated disclosure disproportionately harms innocent defendants because they know less about the crime for which they are charged and therefore are less capable of evaluating the strength of the prosecution's purported evidence and seeking exculpatory evidence. The irony of it. The irony of it. This lack of disclosure obligations prevents defense attorneys from offering sound legal advice to offset the effects of the false evidence ploy because prosecutors are not obligated to disclose the use of a false evidence ploy during the plea bargaining process, defense attorneys can only discover such information through their own resource-intensive fact-finding missions. Even under the rare circumstances where the criminal defense attorney that you have has the time and funding to engage in thorough investigations before you even enter a plea, Prosecutors are permitted to present defendants with plea offers that expire before their attorneys can shed enough light on the strength of the state's case to counteract the false information presented by police. The state is thereby authorized to require defendants and their attorneys to evaluate plea offers almost exclusively based on the perceived likelihood of conviction that they glean during interrogations. Thus, by conveying to law enforcement that no type of false evidence is off limits in their interrogations, the permissive Frazier standard transforms innocent suspects' interaction with police from a valuable source of information to a venue for deceit. The plea bargaining system enables this process to result in wrongful convictions without the opportunity for judicial scrutiny or public review. American popular culture teaches that the bad cop and the falsely sympathetic good cop are both an inevitable and an effective part of the U.S. machinery of justice. From NYPD Blue to The Wire to Making a Murderer to Law and Order Special Victims Unit, police interrogation is depicted as a process that inevitably includes a bullying cop who uses antagonistic tactics among them, lying to suspects to elicit information and also possibly a cajoling good cop who lures the suspect to confess by offering false sympathy, justifications, or less grave ways to characterize the crime. Judicial tolerance for police lies reflects an American political culture in which the lawfulness of deceptive interrogation is largely taken for granted. Yet, deceptive interrogation is not universally accepted. In the United Kingdom, for example, Legislative reforms in the 1990s altered the focus of interrogations requiring investigators to use methods that eschew deception and focus on gathering information rather than eliciting confessions. In Norway, New Zealand, and Australia, interrogators now concentrate on obtaining information and are correspondingly prohibited from lying or manipulating the suspect. 
In Japan, although Japanese interrogators are instructed to apply psychological pressure using techniques similar to the Reed technique, deliberate deception of a suspect about the evidence against him is normally out of bounds. In Germany, the Code of Criminal Procedure explicitly prohibits interrogators from using methods, including, quote, deception, that could impair the accused's freedom to make up his mind and to manifest his will. This prohibition is taken so seriously that Germany is one of the few countries to have a corresponding rule requiring information obtained in violation to be excluded from evidence. In the United States, however, Congress has passed no laws banning deception in investigations by federal law enforcement officers, nor have states or most police departments themselves created broad rules against it. Prosecutors, aka lawyers, are more prohibited and restricted in how they can employ deception because state and federal rules governing prosecutors, lawyers, invariably prohibit practices involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation. The Supreme Court has explained that stricter rules for prosecutors on the ground that prosecutors are, quote, the representative of a sovereignty whose obligation is to govern impartially is as compelling as its obligation to govern at all. While this prohibition on prosecutorial lying appears stringent, it becomes less so when coupled with the permissibility of police deception, at least in the federal system, so long as they are not making the rep- misrepresentations themselves, prosecutors may, quote, direct law enforcement agents to mislead suspects about the agent's identities and goals and whether they are the subject of the investigation. Thus, permissive treatment of deceptive interrogation by police provides a form of legal legitimacy to prosecutorial deception as well. By using officers to speak for them, prosecutors can deceive suspects in ways that would clearly be prohibited were they to engage in the deception directly. My rebuttal for this shorter episode, shorter meaning more to the point and less giggly funny, is unfortunately not one that wraps all of this up with a bow. There is no resolution. There is no, hey, don't worry because this, that, and the other thing happened recently and now it's great and amazing. Um, the reason why lawyers tell you to do what you need to do when you are around law enforcement is not because we have a vendetta against law enforcement. It's because we have a vendetta on your behalf, no matter where that may take you. It does not matter if you committed the crime. It does not matter if you are innocent. The most innocent people have been proven time and time again to be the most vulnerable, to be the people who need to lawyer up the fucking most, to be the people who are the ones who think that, well, I didn't do it, so how can they prove it? They can. They'll try. Cops break the laws all the time, as you guys know. Simply because I'm telling you what they're supposed to do doesn't mean that they're going to do what they're supposed to do. Duh. We've seen it. Okay? Stick to the fucking game plan. Stick to the game plan. It doesn't matter what the police do to you. So long as you maintain that you are affirmatively exercising your right to remain silent and you have to say that and you want your attorney. I want an attorney. I want an attorney. I want an attorney. I'm exercising my right to remain silent and I want an attorney. Knowing your rights is power. Knowledge is power. And in a powerless justice system, in a powerless powerless world, I, I hope to give some of you a little bit of that. I can't be there physically for you, to advocate for you. Your first power is always to advocate for yourself and for your friends and for your family and for your children. I hope that policing and the justice system in this country continues to change and improve and reform. But even then, even then, I'd give you the same advice. Don't trust a hoe. This has been an episode of the Rebuttal Podcast. Thank you for listening. I appreciate all of you. Thank you for watching on YouTube to one to the ones who watch. Thank you for reviewing. Thank you for commenting. Thank you for your feedback. Thank you for posting. 
rebuttal on your stories. I love you guys. I hope you aren't too down in the dumps after this one. I hope that it was educational. I hope that you share it with people who it would impact. I hope that you live life not afraid all the time, but you have the knowledge that you'll need to have maybe one day or need to pass on to someone maybe one day that could save their life or save their case or or just make them feel better and safer. Give them an upper hand, you know? You know, you know?